Hi everyone, Kat here, and I'll be continuing my take on Pokemon Scarlet and Violet minus the Logic Veils, with a few fun glitch references mixed in too. Specifically, we're looking at how Penny might go about canceling Operation Starfall. In this version of Starfall Street, Penny's had a change of heart and decides the school needs Team Star after all, but it's safe to assume Juliana won't back down so easily. She's still attacking the bases, and the code can't be ignored. So, Penny's written an addendum stating that the squads may remain assembled even if defeated. She's submitted it under Giacomo's name and called the remaining bosses to meet with her, Giacomo, and Ortega at the Rukba base. They agree and end the call. Giacomo turns to Penny, arms crossed. He's put two and two together about Penny's true identity as Cassiopeia, but it's clear the end route bosses haven't. Why won't Penny admit that she's the one who sent Juliana after Team Star in the first place? They haven't asked. Penny mutters, which sounds pathetic even before she voices it. Quit acting like you don't trust any of us to see the bigger picture like you do. Even if we're mad about Operation Starfall, we know how important Team Star is to everyone right now. Penny gives a non-committal nod and turns her attention to looking up what she can on Naranja Academy's new student, who now has it out for Team Star after her embarrassing loss at the Rukba base and is totally ignoring anything Cassiopeia tells her. She only had two Pokemon with her, so Penny's best guess is that she'll be looking to expand her team before she attacks again. The awkward tension in the tent is nauseating. So, uh, how about that Cortondo gym leader who got stuck inside a giant foam olive? Ortega asks. The guy has never been the best at starting conversations. Oh yeah, says Giacomo as he turns to Penny. (laughs) Some of our grunts helped the guy out. They wanted to be careful and make sure that cutting the olive wouldn't hurt him in any way. Then they realized he wasn't glued to it and got him out of there quick. Ortega's crew even did an interview with him. Ortega gives a shrug. Meh, we didn't get much interesting. The guy was pretty out of it and still had olive foam in his ears. It's in my documents if you want to look. Penny will never say no to nosing through someone's system and finds the file in short order. The report shows that the gym helper was initially horrified at the wanton olive destruction, begging the grunts to find some way to remove him without destroying one of Cortondo's most precious treasures. They ignored him, and once he'd been extracted, he did seem relieved to be free. He also reported that he hadn't gotten stuck in the olive on his own. Someone had bumped into him, and he'd had no unusual experiences otherwise. It's neither helpful nor exciting info, much to Penny's disappointment. So, she decides to spend their waiting time tracing spam messages from Ortega's phone instead. Normal busy work stuff. She even gets permission first and everything. Penny plugs Ortega's phone into her laptop and starts the trace. As the program runs its routine, she roots through her bag again, hoping she's packed a pair of headphones. Not to listen to anything, but to reduce the surrounding noise so she can focus. She pulls out a case of SD cards, several different cables, and her hardback copy of How to Show Your Face to Your Friends. Ortega looks at it curiously, and she almost shoves it back in before he says, Oh yeah, my sister has that book. She loves anything G.L. Alistair writes. Penny smiles and lays the book to the side. The program reports back its initial findings. No exact coordinates yet, but it can at least give a rough idea of where the spam text came from. Penny frowns as she peruses the results. This doesn't make any sense. I'm getting readings that this one text was sent from the great creator of Paldea? She opens the program settings to see if she calibrated something incorrectly, or perhaps some anomaly is affecting her system? That can't be right. No one's down there. Not true. I know for a fact Professor Sada and Turo both studied in the crater at some point. Even discussed building a lab down there which I'm pretty sure I'm not supposed to know about, but adults talk about all sorts of things when they think kids aren't paying attention. Hmm. Penny leaves the settings alone for now. Before she knows it, a grunt calls from outside the tent, announcing that the bosses have company. The tent flap pulls back and in steps Airy, Atticus, and behind them, Mella. Giacomo is thrilled to see her. She gives a small smile, but doesn't return his enthusiasm. Penny's stomach twists. She's prepared herself for how she'll approach Atticus and Aerie, but seeing Mela too throws her off balance. It feels like she only got off the phone a few minutes ago. Why do flying taxis have to be so efficient, anyway? Mela stands as close to the tent entrance as she can without slipping right back out again. She admits she should have handed over her badge and left Team Star when she lost, but she just can't. Most of her members went back to school, but a few stayed. 
She's been hanging out with Ares' squad for the most part, but she has broken the code, and for that, she's sorry. None of this is typical behavior from Ella, at all. When she makes a mistake, she is more likely to double down on being right than apologize. Of course, this time, she feels genuinely guilty. Giacomo reassures her that they're glad to see her, Team Star boss or not. Mella raises her head and shows just a spark of her old fiery personality returning. Even if she doesn't have an official vote, Ari and Atticus both want to hear her out and consider her opinion when they make their own decisions. Mella meets the gaze of each person in the group. It's strange being in this place together. It should be a happy time, but it feels like their group is one stray ember attack from total meltdown. I want to hear what the boss has to say first, Mella announces. In half a second, all the attention focused on Mella turns to Penny. She hasn't even been properly introduced to Ari, Atticus, or Mella yet. But there'll be time for that later. She looks at Giacomo, who is watching her the most intently, and makes her first confession. This proposal was her idea, not Giacomo's. The second confession? It's her fault Juliana is going after Team Star to begin with. There are no shocking gasps at this revelation. Simply quiet nods and motions for her to continue. So she does. She lays out everything. How she started as Cassiopeia, meeting them through their devices. How she is always meant to show her face but never gotten the nerve. And how she used that same persona to try to force them back to school using Team Star's code against them. I feel like such a massive idiot, she says. I knew how messed up the academy and the teachers were. If even one of them had been paying attention while you were being bullied, they'd have known you had every right to stand up for yourselves. She removes her glasses and rubs at her burning eyes. I knew it, and I urged all of you to face your bullies anyway, hoping the plan would just miraculously work out. She puts her glasses back on, managing to only sniffle a bit before continuing. She's the one who wronged them. She has to own up to it, not start making them all feel bad for her. It just feels like we got carried away, and it was my fault for encouraging it. I felt like all of you were going to get expelled because I didn't have the sense to think through the obvious consequences. Well, you did tell us to call it quits once the bullies left, says Giacomo. We were the ones who ignored your advice, Ari adds on. Of course we did, says Mella, because we love this group and what it does. Atticus nods. Our fiery ally speaks the truth. Penny assures them that she knows that now and forces herself to look at each of them. If they ask her to leave so someone else can be in charge, someone who's seen the value of Team Star from the beginning, she'll be okay with that. But in case it does turn out that way, she wants to see each of them face to face, so many unique personalities, and a single place where they've all come together. Whatever happens in the future, no matter what sort of fuss the school makes about it, I want Team Star to stay together. Mella raises an eyebrow. Including you as the leader? because that's the only way I'd vote for this thing. Penny startles and objects that she hasn't earned that position at all. In fact, quite the opposite. Ari gives a gentle smile. If not for you, Team Star wouldn't exist. We probably would have been the ones leaving school, not the bullies harassing us, Giacomo says. Seriously, Ortega adds on. I remember thinking I can't take one more day of this. And then Team Star came along. Twas thine fear which drove Operation Starfall? says Atticus. Should Team Star continue through its current plight, I too would support thee at the helm. Penny can't stop her eyes from watering up this time, especially as Giacomo calls for a vote for the addendum. Now, since this is officially my addition, I'm voting yes. All others in favor of totally ignoring the code if we lose, say Star. Star. Ari raises her hand and elbows Mela to do the same. An elbowing from Ari is difficult to ignore, and Mella soon lifts her hand. If her vote counts, it's a star from her, too. Ortega raises his staff and complains about how cheesy this is all becoming. Well, I guess you could argue our previous code was made under false pretenses, right? Whatever, star. Everyone has their eyes on Atticus. If there's anyone who will hold to the code's original wording no matter what, it's him. He crosses his arms and closes his eyes in contemplation. Penny wishes she could see his expression while he debates. Then again, considering how many conversations she's had with him behind the phone, he probably sees this as poetic justice. He's not wrong. Hmm, in such circumstances, an addendum could rectify past misdeeds. He begins. 
The group leans in towards him. When they're all pressed in, holding their breaths, Atticus shoots his hand up so fast it moves in a blur. Verily, this addendum receives a star from me. Jeez, you almost spanked me in the face! Mella complains as the group leans back. Everyone chuckles. Of course, the motion has more than passed by now. But there is something to be said for making it official. Then, if you're all in favor, so am I, Penny says with a smile. She puts her hand in to join theirs. Star. Giacomo declares that the motion has passed unanimously, and that everyone can put their hands down now. Most of them sigh with relief. Ari cracks her knuckles. For her, this just means that it's time to get to work. So, what do we have to do? She asks. Atticus bows to Penny. Does the group have need of stealth operations? Would it help if I said anything on fire? Mella offers. Anything at all? Penny holds up her hands. It's a little overwhelming, and they've been in this stuffy tent for a while. The place feels less spacious with six people gathered inside. Let's go outside to talk, she says, and no one objects. As they walk across the base with their heads held high, the grunts of Team Star all watch them eagerly. A few ask what they've discussed, to which Ari simply replies that it was nothing worrying, just long-term plans for Team Star. The phrase long-term lights up the grunt's face, and she quickly spreads the word among the group. If you climb the scaffolding here, Ortega says, pointing to a space near the gate, you get an amazing view of the mountains. Always helps me think. Ari only takes two wide steps to get up the ladder, but Mela needs some help getting up in her immovable boots. Atticus decides that ladders are for mere mortal non-ninjas and takes a graceful, silent leap up onto the scaffolding instead. He then holds Ortega's staff as he, Penny, and Giacomo take the normal way up. Ortega has just taken his staff back when his phone chimes the new message. For the moment, he ignores it, and the group turns their attention back towards the scenery. Ortega wasn't wrong. The view is gorgeous up here. A rose-orange sky spreads across the lavender-tinged mountains, like something out of a watercolor painting. Penny breathes deeply, the chill air burning her nose, but feeling so fresh on her tongue. It almost tastes like snow is about to fall. The sunset comes earlier than expected, which means the days are probably getting even shorter than before. She glances down, where the boards of the fencing cast odd shadows, some flickering like they aren't sure where to fall. Then finally, she looks farther out into the grass, where Flabebe float and dance, while Go-Goat graze unperturbed. Among the Go-Goat, a single Azura bounces happily. It's pretty small, even for its species, and it's an unusual Pokemon for this area. But the Go-Goat all bleat with glee as it bounces around to chat with each of them. Well, Penny supposes, it's better than a Pokemon that's absolutely massive and destroying everything in its path. Azuro bounces a little too high and accidentally flips itself upside down. The helpless creature cries and kicks its minuscule feet in the air. An older-looking Go-Goat nudges its tail until Azuro rights itself and bounces carefree once again. Penny smiles at the sight of it. A group of Pokemon so different and yet the Azurul has been adopted into their family. And just like Team Star, they'll weather anything together. The danger might be increasing, but in a strange way, Penny's hope is too. Thanks for watching. I actually included a couple glitch references in this story too, so if anyone's curious, here they are. The first one, well, all right, it's unclear if it's a glitch or if it's just something they decided to build into the game, but a lot of times you'll see groups of all the same species of Pokemon, and there'll be just one lone Pokemon hanging out with them. It's pretty cute. If it wasn't on purpose, I'll call this a happy little accident. Glitch number two is a glitch I've referenced before, but it's still a fun one, where the helper at the Cortondo gym can get stuck inside the giant olive you roll around. Glitch number three is also new, and it's very interesting. When I first heard of this one, I was skeptical, then I saw it for myself. It was lightning fast the first time, but I'll slow it down after I show it once. You can see these tiny little Pokemon appearing on the screen, a lot of them sideways or upside down. This glitch actually comes from the game preloading the 2D overlay of Pokemon spawns for your map. When the game's working correctly, these are cleared from the player's view before they start playing. When it's not, well, you've got a 2D Gyarados floating alongside you. Congratulations! Thanks so much for watching, hope you enjoyed this video. Until next time, happy reading and happy training!